Yes. I think we are recording now. So, yes, I want to uh, make a presentation of me. I am Susanna Sophie, Sophia Potemba, and I am a belly dancer in Denmark. And this year, I have 30 years anniversary from my uh, of my dance school. So it's a big year, but I think uh, it will be celebrated next year where we have the vaccine and the corona is, I hope, gone away. So I am so honored and happy because today I have a guest and it is George Dimitri Sava. Um, George, he has um, more than 50 years experience in Arabic music, performance, history, and theory, and he has performed and lectured worldwide. He in Canada, USA, Brazil, Mexico, and in Europe. He has been in Spain, Italy, Holland, Sweden, and Denmark, and Finland, and Greece. And in the Middle East, he has been in Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, Syria, Lebanon, Kuwait, and United Arab, Arab Emirates. In Egypt, George, he studied piano with the Madame Irene Brachides, herself a student of the famed educator Alfred Cortot. George studied canoon theory and voice at the higher, the higher Institute of Arabic Music. After George, uh, he was immigrating to Canada, he studied ethnomusicology at the University of Toronto and obtained his doctorate in historical Arabic musicology. He has taught graduate and undergraduate courses on mid, um, uh, he modern and religious music of the Middle East at the University of Toronto and at York University. George has written so many books and articles about music and music theory. In 2005, George received the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the Egyptian Ministry of Culture for his research in Arabic music history. So wonderful. George has taught music and music theory to so many belly dancers. I could continue for a long time just to tell about what, what George has done in his life. And we are so lucky that George is here. So George, it's better that you can tell us about your fantastic life with the Arabic music. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. I have to tell you that my whole uh, involvement with music was just a fluke. Uh, it happened because my aunt did not get married. I will explain. <laughs> okay. In, in the old days, when you are a father or a brother, you prepare the dowry of your sister or daughter. Usually it is a oud, a lute. But with Western influence, my father decided to buy a piano for his sister. But his sister, my aunt, never got married. So we inherited a piano in the house. And I started to play by ear with two fingers. And then my father said, no, no, we have to get you a teacher. And that's how it happened. I uh, started to learn piano at the age of 10 with Madame Irene Drakidis. And I have to thank my experience in Scandinavia. In 19, uh, when I was 19, in 1966, I went to Sweden in the city north of Stockholm uh, called Arboga. Okay. I say a plant to work, you know, because I was studying engineering. So part of your study is to work in a factory in Europe. So I played piano for the Swedish people who were so polite. And then they said to me, you're Egyptian, why don't you play an Egyptian instrument? I said, oh, 
they are right. And I always loved the sound of the kanun. So I made sure when I came back to Egypt to find the teacher and learn the kanun. I was very lucky that my teachers, I had more than one, were the last, uh, the last kanun players who belonged to the old school. And their own teacher were very famous. They played for Abdel Wahab, for Omar Kalsoum in that, in that very early days. Wow. And uh, yeah, this, this is my, uh, my, my profession, my musical profession, because my aunt never got married. Otherwise, I would have been an engineer. Oh, it, but it's, <laughs> it's so wonderful. And life is wonderful. You go around, but yeah. You yeah. was in Sweden and you figured out that you should be a canoe player. Yeah. Uh, but you play so wonderful. I have been on your YouTube you. channel and I listen. It's so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, the, the other part was that when I was studying canoe, there was a big movement in Egypt and it was born out of the European telling the Egyptian and the Arab in general, you guys are inferior. You are you have no technology. Your music is primitive. Why don't you modernize and have harmony and counterpoint and orchestras, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So I said to myself, I looked at Western music, medieval time, and Arabic music in the medieval time. Both were singer and a oud player, a lute player. We started with the same. We remained. 10 centuries later, Europe branched out into from monophony to uh, polyphony, two voices, then three voices, then counterpoint, polyphony, harmony, etc. But in Egypt, they have no idea about anything before the Baroque era. We have no, uh, no idea about medieval or Renaissance music. We only know Baroque, classical, romantic. So I said to myself, because you know I was trained in French schools, you learn to think. So I said to myself, how, what are the steps that Europe took to go from monophony to the Baroque era? So I had to study the medieval Renaissance era to see all the steps where they got the harmony and counterpoint. And the job was so immense. I said, I don't want to improve quote unquote on Arabic music. Arabic music is very rich the way it is, let it be. So this was the result of two years of being a master in Western music history. I did learn a lot, I have to admit. Wow, that, uh, that's amazing that you say this because um, I always hear that, uh, and I learned always that Arabic music, it is the best, it is uh, not the best. I mean, it is the most complicated It is very complicated. Yeah. Uh, because, because we use it, we don't realize how complicated it is uh, until you write it down and analyze yeah. it and say, my God, this is uh, so rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that it, I think it's so wonderful um, that uh, you, you know the Western music, do you know the Arabic music? So you, you can, you, that's why you have. Mm, You have done so much in your life. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I think when, you... when I finished my master, I said, okay, how about since I'm in Canada and Canada is a very wealthy nation and you have huge library, like the University of Toronto has over 10 million books and, and you have everything printed in the Arab world, plus all the work of the Orientalist, the last 200 years in French, German, and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, uh, hang on a sec, Italian and English. Okay. So, so I said, you know, I want to study the history of this music. So I spent seven years doing a PhD in Middle Eastern music, culture, and social history, emphasizing on music. And wow. that's what I make all, all the discoveries going back to the Baghdad in the 9th and 10th century. Yeah. And it's so rich. I need another 200 years to cover it. But I won't <laughs> live another 200 years, so. <laughs> <laughs> But 
but uh, maybe when when you die and you come back maybe you will come back to learn to do more <laughs> yeah. one, one one life is enough yeah yeah but i mean wow um, and that was, of course, it was in Toronto that you, you said you have all this possibility. You did it for so many years. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, before you went to Toronto, you were living in Egypt. And uh, I want to ask you about, because you were living in the golden era. I mean, you have... You have um, you have seen, you have the feeling of what was, how it was at that time. Can you tell a little about uh, about that? And, um, you know, with Farid el Atrash, Abdel Ahlem Hafiz, and Muhammad Abdel Wahab, have you some stories? Um, Very simple, it's joy. The golden era, the dance, the music, the comedy, the poetry, it's all joy. Joy. And my nanny used to take me with my sister to watch the latest movie for the little Atrash, Samia Gamal, and the comedian Ismail Yassin, Tahaya Karyoka Naim It was such a joy to watch. Beautiful music, beautiful dancing, and it was always joyful. And we went to this cinema that had two films, one American and one Egyptian. The American came first, and it gave me cramps in my stomach. It was cowboys, Indians, violence, killing. And then you get the Egyptian one, love, belly dancing music. What a contrast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's funny. Hmm. Because USA or the, the Western film also have a lot of uh, love and- Yes joyful film but it was uh, the western that was uh, the Still. violence yeah yeah so now i have to tell you a secret mm. when i was a child i was like five or six years old i fell in love with senia gamal who must have been in her 20s or 30s and i said to my mother when i grow up i'm going to marry samia gamal <laughs> Oh, no, that's so fine. Yeah. As a child, you know, what can mm, you do? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, that, yes, that, uh, sometimes I, I see the old film, but you are very much into this. Uh, you were in last weekend, you were in the weekend where they had, uh, they had this uh, from the golden era. Yes. Weekend. Three days. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. It's wonderful that that you and the the others uh, are getting together and celebrating and dancing and playing music from all that from that era. It is That's wonderful right. that it's still is living. I mean, this. I you know next week in Peru they have another one. Okay. It'll be the, it'll be the Latin American dancer doing the golden era. Oh, nice! That's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you want, I'll send you the link. Yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I must uh, tell the audience because that is how I met you because I was in Shining uh, Belly Dancers. Uh, she made an event with the Golden Era. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there you were talking and there I think, oh, this man, I must, I must, I must talk more with him. He is very interesting. <laughs> Thank yes, you. yes. Uh, you talked about uh, the music and and thing, some things. So um, and immediately I wrote down, you know, I I found you actually, and it's easy because you go and you write georgedimitrisava.com, and there your homepage is there. And there also is a lot of information also for the dancers. Thank so, um, yeah, um, we will talk about this again. Uh, I just want to know if you have, um, you, now you're, you're talking about your aunt uh, didn't get married. That's why you, 
<laughs> you played music. But uh, yeah. can you tell about uh, you, uh, your family experiences with music and dance from that time, from the golden era time when you were living in Egypt? You do you have some of your, I don't know, uncle who was playing? Uh, my, my father played piano by ear. Hmm? My mother was, she, she sang very beautifully. She had a beautiful voice. She sang at home. And of course, we had the radio, we had the movies, but also we went to the Byzantine church, Greek Orthodox church. Yeah. And there is nothing more beautiful in the world as Byzantine music. So I was sort of surrounded by all this magnificent music. Yeah. Era, uh, you know, standard piano classical music, Byzantine music, you can't, you can't go wrong. And th this, this is precisely why I love uh, old traditional music, the music of my grandfather and a bit of my father era and fusion, if it is done well, often fusion is done badly. The most successful was Farid al -Atrash. He fused Italian uh, music, Italian folk music, Latino music, and he did such a great job. Other composer did sometimes well, sometimes not. But Farid is the, the champion of fusion. Okay, so that is also very interesting that you tell that because um, Mohammed Abdel Wahab, he did a lot of, could you say fusion? Because he had yes. a lot of other written into his music too. Yeah, he did, he did some fusion, uh, like when he copied uh, Verdi. Because that tune melts itself well with Arabic music. Or another one, uh, do not kiss me in my eyes, because mm. kissing me in my eye will make us separate, will separate us. <laughs> this must be Italian, Sicilian, something in six eight. Yeah, I know but, this. This I know. Yeah, I know it when you sing it because I cannot quite remember when you say the names, but this I know. Ah. Also, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So hmm? that way he was successful. Other things, he was not successful at all. This is just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Upset with me because they think Abdul Wahab is God. There is no God. We're human. <laughs> yeah, everyone is a human yeah. here on on Earth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's it's interesting. I really appreciate that you you tell what you think and mean because uh, that is our right to have a meaning. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you have seen uh, so much, so it's it's uh, delicious that you can. Uh, tell about that yeah so how it was to live in the in Egypt uh, at that time it was uh, full of joy it was full of uh, magic it was full of everything in the golden era time in Egypt yes. it was yes. wonderful time in Egypt it, yeah it, yeah it, it really was and then we get the 1956 war the CIA coup that brought the army in charge of Egypt with Nasser and the, it was sort of a good time and also very turbulent time. Yeah. There were, there were wars. Uh, part of the American policy was to chase out the Europeans. So the American will have their markets in Egypt yeah. and many other places in the Arab world. So it was not always that happy time. Yeah. But I buried myself in music. I stayed away from politics. Yeah, that is, uh, that's fine. Um... But uh, so when uh, when did you go to when did you leave Egypt? How uh, and to go, when was uh, at what time was you yeah, in? I, I finished engineering in 1968. Was 1969. Never to touch it again. <laughs> and then I spent one year to get my piano degree and my canoe degree. So I ended up coming to Canada with three degrees: engineering. Piano and Kanun. Wow. Was in 1970. I was 23 years old. Yeah. yeah. And I was told in the Canadian embassy, the best place to go for music research is Toronto. 
because the university has a great library and it has the most important music department in Canada. Yeah. It was small, but I got very good training. There's no super. doubt about it. Yeah, super. And you stay there, you're still there. So I didn't move, I'm still there. Yeah, that's <laughs> wonderful. But you have been around and around and around. So that, yeah. Um, how was it being in the new culture? Um, at that time, it was new for you and your education and your your work with Egypt music in Canada. How was it? Was it uh, you just boom fit in to everything, or you? It was something very very new for you. It was new, and uh, Toronto was extremely Anglo at the time, very English. People are very polite very generous, very helpful. But when it comes to the Egyptian sense of humor and flirting with the girls, I failed miserably. In <laughs> Egypt, when you like a girl, you go like this. <laughs> I like you. Much like the movies, <laughs> Egyptian movies. You do that in Canada and they think you're crazy. <laughs> so, I said, you know what, I'm going to educate these Canadians. And I wrote a book from medieval time, Erotica, Love and Music in Arabia. <laughs> it is the, in a way, it is a Kama Sutra of the Arab world, plus a lot of funny stories, plus a lot of sad poetry and happy poetry. And when you read it, you realize how tough tough women were back then. They're not, you know, sort of to be messed around. They're very tough ladies. I'll just give you an example. One male poet improvised a line of poetry to a female poet saying, <laughs> how about you let me <laughs> sleep with you anyway? I will not hurt your back. She answered in poetry, it will not hurt my back, but it's going to fill my tummy. <laughs> See how brilliant? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And immediate. He and it's 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 a poem measured. She answered measured the same the same meter the same rhyme. This is just one of very many stories. So, I, I suggest to all my belly dancer friend buy this book, read it at candlelight with red wine with your beloved. You read the story, your beloved read the story. It's all very short stories, but they're so funny. <laughs> That's my contribution. <laughs> yeah, the, wonderful. This is also new because I've never heard about this. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So, and, and I also like your, um, your point because I asked you, oh, you are in a new culture, but also you say, I want to give the new culture something from my culture. So uh, that is super. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And then you started, which, which uh, music instrument are your favorite to play? Um, the, uh, from the time I was a child and I hear Kanun on the radio, I ran to the radio and I was like this. Wow, this is so beautiful. It's a mesmerizing instrument. So powerful, so beautiful. And I was always attracted by sound. Like if you give me the most beautiful belly dancer and a not as beautiful a female singer, I'll, go, I'll always go with, with the female singer because her voice softened my heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful yes but and um but you then you started to play the canoon yeah then yes and is that your favorite in music instrument yourself oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah this is your main instrument because uh you also play uh zagat yeah a bit of cymbal a bit of drums yeah but but mainly to teach the dancers because there is a terrible trend in America where Billy Dancer tried to play the drum pattern. 
this is not the job of the dancer, that's the job of the drummer. And if an American dancer goes to Egypt and plays the drum pattern, the drummer will get very upset at her. Okay. Because she's duplicating what he's doing. The point, like the golden era, is to add another layer of sound to the drumming, but not imitate the drumming. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. Interesting. And Mel Melissa Gamel did a great job uh, during our workshops. She explained the three patterns. You also find them in my book. But Melissa, being a dancer, she showed how to use them while dancing. She did a very, very good job. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you have. Yes, you have been working uh, together with many dancers. Yeah. Also, also, did you work together with uh, Melissa? Also, um, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, with Melissa, Yasmina was a very big school in uh, Toronto. With Nadal Masreya, Bojenka, uh, who was in the states originally, and have her have her photo of my book, Bojenka and Sibir. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes, I have seen that. That is so wonderful. A wonderful dancer also, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I played for Lulu in Brazil and all her dancers. And I'll talk a bit more about this later. Yeah. Plus Egyptian dancers like Dua Salam and Nadal Masri. Yeah. yeah. I just love to play for dancers. It's not only I inspire them, but I look at them, they inspire me. And yeah. they let me play other things. And I can't go on for 20, 25 minutes nonstop doing Taksim. Yes, I saw some of the videos. Uh, I think it was on your YouTube. Yes, it was on your YouTube where, where you have um, you have talked about the music before. And then sometimes it was improvisations. And it was so magic for you and, and the dancers who was dancing. So. Uh, Especially and, Lulu. And, and nice to see, very nice to see, yeah. It's unbelievable. We had no rehearsal, no editing, just one shot. Yeah. And we inspired each other. So it's one, one, one of my best performance ever. Yeah, that is, uh, that is magic for the heart and for the, for the brain. It's, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. What, yeah. Um, you have been around in the world, we talked about, but I, I would like to talk about that you also have been in Denmark because I was very surprised <laughs> um, to find out that you have been in Denmark. So I was, um, I was asking what, uh, and, and, um, and I found out it was Lisbeth Torp Jensen. Yeah. Yeah. And I phoned her. <laughs> I phoned her and I don't know her, but I wanted to know um, what happened in Denmark. And, but just now I forgot at w uh, which year you was. It was in the 92, 93 or? No, 1986. 96? No, 86. 86, yes, 86. Yeah, I, I, I met Lisbeth in 85 in Stockholm in Helsinki. And we became good friends. And she invited me in 86 to go to Denmark and give two lectures at the university about medieval music in Baghdad. And I gave a concert. Yeah. yeah. So that's, wonderful. that's the connection. Uh, so wonderful. Wow. At that time, I, I actually, I was in Copenhagen. It was in Copenhagen, you. Yes. Yes, because yeah. Um, so I um, yeah, and Lisbeth Torb Jensen, she became also in National Museum of Denmark. She yeah. became the leader of the folklore and the folklore music uh, department. So she has done a lot of things. So I'm I'm grateful oh, yeah. to you that now I have a contact with her, and she was also wow. very surprised. And what George Sava? Oh, you must say hello to him. And, you know, she was, what do you, you know, it was just a normal day and I phoned her and was very interesting. And so that's, uh, I'm proud of you have been in Denmark. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. 
when she did her doctorate on Greek dancing, she found some of the analysis of rhythm in the work of Farabi in the 10th century, okay. very useful for her uh, steps. To analyze the steps of the dancer, she used Farabi theory of rhythm. Wow. Yeah. She, yeah. She's a very smart lady. Yeah. Very smart. I, that is also what I, I felt. So, um, yeah. So it's, I will contact her again. And of course, I will also tell, send her so she can see this interview. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Yeah. What um, I would like to that you tell a little more about because you, you have co collaborated with so many belly dancers. So can you tell a little more a story from one of your project with a belly dancer where you were performing or maybe you were teaching or, or something because <clears throat> you could also tell uh, about your books because maybe that was a start to just tell what your books, you just uh, showed me a book where Bosen Bosenka was on. And uh, so please tell about that. Well, when, when I left the university, I contacted Yasmina and I said, you know what? I will give lecture for your students. And then I got involved in her big concerts. She does not do just one dancer with, with a band. Just big bunch of dancer choreo choreographies, and she's very good at it. So part of teaching uh, was producing this book. So there's a chapter on Maqam, a chapter on all the instruments from Egypt. And if you ever come to my house, they're all there. Wow. Folkloric and classical, all there. Yeah, wonderful. And then the last chapter is the musical forms and how it's important to understand the musical form to choreograph properly mm -hmm. about the transitions. But most importantly, since a lot of dancers don't treat music, was to bring about a medieval notation from 13th century Baghdad. So you have, for example, a waltz right here. Yeah. It's a simple type of notation. You divide the circle into three, like um, papa, um, papa. Hmm? So you have dum, tak, tak, dum, tak, tak. I gave it in syllabic notation and also in music notation, but this one is the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I give them 20 different uh, rhythm that you encounter in Egyptian music popular, classical, folk, therapeutic, Sufi. All of them are in that, in that, in that book. Uh, so I, I taught at her school and many other schools. Then I was invited to Brazil to spend two weeks to, uh, to teach Brazilian dancers. And they even uh, have a book, that same book in German and Brazilian. One second. Wow. Oh, it's wonderful, yeah. With Lulu again. Lulu, yeah. And, and then uh, you decided that um, she, she, sorry? But where can you buy the book? Uh, this one, I can send you, uh, I can send you the, um, the link to get, to get the German and the Brazilian edition. Okay. okay. So uh, yeah, that's fine because then I can put also the link uh, on the YouTube channel because if people want to know where can I buy the book, you know? Sure. sure. Yeah. If you go to my uh, website, it's all there also. It's all there. So that's fine. That's and then fine. we decided to get most of my two CDs plus Bojenka book and got 33 Brazilian dancers to dance to them. Now, these are my two CDs. They were designed to bring back the sound of the golden era. And I used the canoe from 1900, very old canoe. I'll show you a photo of it. 
Now, every CD has a booklet that it cost me almost half the money to produce the book that to produce the CD, but it's a lot of information. And this is the old canoe from 1900. Wow. There's no levers and it's so powerful and so beautiful. And we used the drums and tambourine all made of fish skin, no plastic. Plastic is too harsh. Yes. Terrible. Can you get fish, uh, fish skin? Can, can you get it still? Can you still you can, get it? But, uh, if you go to Egypt, you can, but you have to order it because they don't make them anymore. Okay. And you have to have it, if you have it, have, you have it shipped, uh, they have to have a special case because it's ceramic and fish. So it will cost you around $1,200. It's a lot of money, but you get the best drum. It's but, so beautiful. But you know what? Um, when I was younger, I went to Muhammad Ali Street and I buy, oh. I bought a drum there and in the clay and yes. with the yes. mosaic. Oh, it's beautiful. So beautiful. So, and it has, it had fish skin. Oh, did you lose it or break it? It, the fish skin is broken now. Yeah, it breaks, yeah. Because I didn't also, maybe if I, I had, if I, um, I didn't know how to take care of the fish skin. Yeah, if, if it's dry, it will break. Yeah, but it's, oops, it finished. And, you know, I'm looking for where can I buy a fish skin? Because um, earlier I was also working with a um, live musician and... Um, Sahir, who was playing the drum, he had his own drum. But when he saw my drum from Egypt, you know, he said, oh, I must, I, he was big eyes and he loved my drum. He played and, and the drum was so amazing. The sound yeah. was so amazing. And I, I have never heard a drum sound like yeah. this, it's like so my drum. But um, I, I don't know where to buy the fish. In. They use special clay and they have their own uh, way to temper it and to uh, bake it. And I don't know what they add to it. It's just a secret of the trade. Plus they get the fish skin from Aswan all the way south, not, not, not in Cairo. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a bit expensive, but you get the best drum ever. So, yeah, I don't know when it will be. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's nice to have it. And it's, it is in my dance school and uh, I can remember the sound in my heart. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Um, but it's wonderful. And also you have this, uh, I have also your book, you wrote a book and I bought it on, you sent it to me on PDF file. Yes. And I'm very book. happy for this book where you write about uh, also the written yes and, yeah and uh, of course i know uh, something about the written uh, but it's nice i'm always you know i'm i i can i feel i must learn always i can learn and learn and you put you put some very special classical uh, written Arabic written in your material, it's so interesting. Well, the gentleman who did the rhythms, this is so interesting. Michel Ba'lou. Yes, I cannot see him. Yeah. On the left? Yeah. He played for Tahir Karyuka and Samia Gamal. And wow. And he knew for the Atrash Abdullah, we knew everybody. And when you hear his tambourine, forget Makanun. Makanun is nothing compared to his beautiful tambourining. Oh, so uh, well, uh, that is your opinion, but. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, yo, that is fine. So it is in the book, in the book, which kind of book did you show me? Where in which? Bujinka one. Now, okay, yeah. And also the second CD, this CD. We have we have Michel with that on this CD. Yeah, okay. And it all very old dances. And one of them 
it, it is just amazing. It's a type of dancing from Syria that looks like the Italian dance of the Quattrocento, 14th century. Mm -hmm. These dances from Italy had a, a musical phrase with an open cadence, which means not complete. Then the phrase is repeated with the closed cadence. So you have AC1, AC2, and it goes on. The same pattern as the handkerchief dance from Syria in the 19th century. Oh. 500 years, and that style of Italian Quattrocento survived all the way to Syria. Who invented it? We don't know. It's just so beautiful. Wow, it's interesting. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I would like to ask you about, um, about if you have any good advice for new dancers of today regarding the music and dance from Egypt. Okay, uh, for if they want really good drumming, uh, look at Yasmin Henkish series of drums from Mr. Khamis Henkish. Mm -hmm. He's a phenomenal drummer. And she Khamis uh, Henkish? Henkish. H E N K E S. -H. Yeah, but he, is he dead? No, no, he's still alive. He's still alive? Yeah. Now, if you want to study on Zoom, Hani Morgan is the best. He can teach you Daraboka, tambourine, cymbals. Mm -hmm. Hani Morgan, he's the best of the best. Hani Morgan, yeah. Morgan, yeah. I, I, can, I can send you his name. He's, he's on Facebook and he, he has a Zoom today, a Zoom meeting with Yasmina, teaching her students tambourine. Okay, and Yasmina, she is. You talked about before earlier, she is yeah. the one in Toronto who, Correct. yeah, who is a fantastic belly dancer. Yeah. And she has a school and she has a company, a dance company. Yeah. That did a lot of productions. Yeah. So wonderful. Yes. Um, but um, I was also think thinking if you have a good advice uh, because you are more interesting in the music from the from the golden era time and um, i was thinking maybe if you see dancers who is dancing uh, today to the music today not from the golden era but um do you do you have something to the dancers to say that maybe they could uh, learn from the golden era time so they can use today or do you have something you would you will pinpoint sure sure the golden era music is very difficult because it is subtle the drum was not used very much it was the tambourine okay just give me a second See if you can get yourself this four CD package of Sami Shawa. Yeah. Of the 20s and 30s. It's himself on the violin plus tambourine. S beautiful selection of dances of that era. The dancer has to dance not to the drum, but to the melody. You have to feel the melody. And there is a lot of a hidden meaning, musical meaning that you have to uncover. And the worst thing dancers do is to dance to the drum only. That's, Randa will tell you, if you dance to the drum, you're not a good dancer. And Raya Hassan said, these dancers, uh, she didn't specify which country, dance all wrong because they only dance to the drum beat when they should be dancing to the music. So the Egyptian dancer knows the music. She does not need to study the music. She knows it and she dances to the music. 
And this is why I made that, that book to help dancers understand the music and dance to the music. Uh, there is also the Alme, all kind of beautiful songs to which the dancer danced. And you can buy them from the Amar Foundation. I'll, I'll send you the link later on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, try to dance to the melody. And that's what Melissa Gamel mentioned when you had The Shining. Yeah. Uh, Shining piece. And also la uh, two weeks ago. And she said, the beauty of Samia Gamel and Tahaya is the dance to the melody. Don't concentrate too much on rhythm. Follow the melody. F follow the melody. So I, I tell dancers in Europe, North America, watch a lot of black and white movies of the golden era. Later on, it's good too. I mean, so Hirzaki and Nagwa uh, Fuad, Fifi Abdu, they're phenomenal. But they know it's not the, it's not the golden era anymore. It's a different era, different music, heavy drumming. Uh, heavy fusion, some good, some not so good. But the golden era is just golden in everything. Yeah. Thank you. That was very, very good advice. Thank you. Thank you. That we can, we can use that. Every Everyone in the whole world can use that. So, um, yes. Um, now I think uh, time has come, so we have to finish. But I want to thank you so, so, so much for this interview. My pleasure. Uh, I'm sure everyone in the whole world will be happy to see this. So. Um, and say hi to Lisbeth when you talk to her. I will, I will, I will, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.